Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in. Hello, Red Laughlin here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is a worldwide audience, international, USA Global TV and radio. It's a wonderful show to learn many, many things. On Talking Heads today, we're going to continue our discussion on pain, pain management, pain control, but from a natural perspective. What can we do ourselves to alleviate, to even prevent maybe in some cases? That's one of the topics I want to talk about is how do we prevent pain? But that's not today. But regardless, let me get my slides lined up here first so we can begin that one. There's the first one. Okay, disclaimers. Uh, and I don't know why I have weight management there. That's incorrect. I'll have to change that one. Uh, I'm a researcher. I am not a doctor, never have been. I've never worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I fell in love with chemistry in high school. I got a degree in it and then ended up in Vietnam, never got a chance to practice it. But several years ago, my wife came down with breast cancer, and in part of my assisting, helping, I was able to reacquaint myself with chemistry, but from the perspective of what's going on in the human body, what, what controls do we have? So I started looking at what's happening at the cellular level from a cause and effect perspe perspective, and you know, this thing causes this to happen. What can I do to this thing to make this happen or not happen or happen faster? And there's a lot of things. If we understand the chemistry, then we can control things a lot. So if you have a cause, you should be able to at least address or fix a problem. But if all you're treating are symptoms, then you'll always be treating symptoms. Pain, like weight management above, is one of those things that's a very individual thing. Responses vary. You can have two people the exact same uh, pain causing event, yet one will feel absolutely blown away and another one, yeah, it's, it hurts, but it is what it is. But pain is a complex physiological and psychological experience that serves to protect us, our, our physical being, our mechanism, so that we don't have additional potential harm or damage. So in other words, if I put my hand on that hot stove and I yank it away because it's hot, I've learned two or three things. In other words, don't touch a hot stove. But if I left my hand there because I wasn't getting that feedback, you know, then I would have a serious problem. So even though it doesn't sound right, you know, pain is a preventive mechanism. Uh, I wanted to do a section on pain hacks, and that's what we're talking about here. This is my personal perspective. Uh, we're looking at a cause of a pro problem. In some cases, it's pretty obvious if it's a particular kind, let's say a sunburn. Well, we know what caused the sunburn there, but sometimes a headache, a lower back ache, stomach ache, a lot of things may have more than one cause. So I look at it, what can be done without drugs, without surgery? Now, it may end up eventually being corrected by surgery, may end up having drugs to do it, but what are those things that we can control ourselves? What what should we be talking to our doctor about? And if we can provide that level of awareness, now you have a place to start. Your health is your responsibility. On this program, we start with awareness, education, then action. So if you're already on medication and I suggest something, don't just take it to the bank. Talk to your doctor about it because there's a reason the medicine you're on is there. To take and do something else is not necessarily the smartest thing to be doing. Okay, we talked uh, last week about a various number of, of 
injuries that that have pain associated with tennis elbow, stomach ache, headache, et cetera. And so we're going to continue that list. We got down through stomach ache last week. We're going to start off today with, with headache. And we're going to be looking at what are these things, what are the causes, the general causes. There's a lot more than, than what I have listed. But what options do you have? And again, there's a lot more than I have listed. If I said, okay, you have an earache, uh, Google natural treatments for earaches, and it's going to give you something. And it may be something you don't even know about, something that's easy to, to do. So that's a place to start. That's where I started a lot of these things. I've had these kinds of pains. And I just, you know, from my own research, oh, this works, this one doesn't work. But regardless, let's talk about headaches. That's where we left off last time. You have a lot of causes for headaches. There's not one single thing that you can say, yeah, this it may, but there's other things too. So muscle tension, stress, uh, infection, sometimes withdrawal from something, caffeine in particular, dehydration, big, big item. A lot of medicines sometimes have a headache interface. Uh, hormonal changes, environmental factors. Lots and lots and lots of things cause a headache. But if you haven't been going through withdrawal from caffeine, okay, you check that one off the list. If you're not on any meds and you look at the list of contraindications on the meds, okay, well, maybe meds is not the problem. Uh, I'm hydrating okay. So you can start to cross these things off. Well, am I under stress? Well, I can do some stress management. That, that might work. But eventually you might hone in on it. I know people who carry a lot of weight on their shoulders. Uh, my daughter being one, and she has, she's a deputy sheriff. So she's got her vest, she's got her gun belt, she's got all sorts of things that are attached. And if you're not properly set up, that's all pulling down on you. You're straining that, that neck muscle, and you're going to get a headache. You're going to get a backache. You're going to get a shoulder ache. A lot of things happen out. What can we do about it? Well, stop doing whatever you're doing. Well, that might not necessarily always be the case. But rest, hydration, if you're on caffeine withdrawal, maybe something with a little bit of caffeine. I'm not talking about downing you know, a whole uh, glass of iced tea or Coke or something, but maybe just the two or three swallows gets enough back in the system to make a difference. Uh, relaxation, cold compresses, sometimes cold on the back of the neck, on the top of the head, a lot of places you can do. Breathing exercises, sometimes even a lifestyle change. Uh, if stress is causing the problem, you need to get into stress management. And there are many different kinds. Google has it. YouTube has many of them. And just because one doesn't work doesn't mean another might not work. So I would say at least two or three options. Same thing with the breathing exercises. If I'm doing a left nostril, right nostril, pranayama, I want to be able, okay, well, maybe that one did more. Let me try another one. Let me try another one. So it may be that breathing is not my issue. That's not going to help me. But maybe I'm going to find one that works really well, really quickly. Uh, EFT, for me, emotional freedom techniques, work very good because it has a relaxation component to it. But depending on your headache, the severity and the duration are something super critical. Uh, one of my brothers died several years ago, and he had been self-treating headaches for I found out later for decades and just over the counter medicine. For what reason he never went to the doctor? I don't know. He got back from spending months over in Saudi Arabia, back home. He's on the phone and literally drops dead. He had a, a brain aneurysm. Um, would that have made a difference? He had been to a doctor. I hope so, but I don't know. Anyway, moving right along. Foot, leg, and hip issues. Um, one of my personal favorites. I've been a runner for decades. And my son was a runner in high school and the process of my following his progression and becoming more involved with running clubs and other things out there, I found lots and lots and lots of ways to injure myself. Uh, plantar fasciitis, I've had them on both legs twice at least. Uh, that's where you, you know, are comfortable. You get up and you start walking all of a sudden. You, know, you have a big sharp pain in, in your heel or in your foot and you walk another 10 steps and it gradually goes away. That's probably plantar fasciitis. Uh, bunions, uh, gout, uh, having just worn shoes, sometimes that throws your gait off a little bit, your muscle imbalance. Uh, that's 
predominantly seen with chondromalacia patella. Uh, and that's easy to, to diagnose by yourself. If you're walking downstairs and you have some really severe knee problems, but you don't have that same problem going upstairs, you might have what's called chondromalacia. Uh, bursitis, uh, meniscus tears, I've had one of those. Uh, ligament injuries, had a couple of those. Gout, never had gout. Arthritis, we're going to talk a lot more about arthritis down the road, so I'm going to let that one go. Peripheral artery disease. And we talked about worn shoes. Well, you start wearing out shoes a certain way, uh, that can create problems. But you may actually have one leg longer than the other, and that can create a lot of problems. But the foot, the leg, the hip, they're all interrelated. And one may be, okay, I'm having shin splints. Well, that may be worn out shoes. I'm having gout. Well, the gout might be because of a diet issue. Uh, I'm having muscle imbalance. You know, there are things that can be done very, very easily. Let's move them on here. Okay. The typical ice, heat, and rest is a, a good combination for almost any part of that. I like to take a very light dish cloth, dish towel, and just make it barely moist. Let's say I have it on my knee as an issue. I will put that on there, then I'll take some frozen corn or frozen peas and wrap around it, and then roll the thing back on top. And about 20 minutes is about the maximum I'll go on ice. Take it off, let it come to room temperature, if I have the ability to stick something that I can heat up in a microwave for a little bit, put that on for uh, five minutes or so. But basically, just go to height, ice, and heat back and forth. Uh, lots of information out there, both on Google and on YouTube. Uh, find somebody you really trust. See if that'll work. If you know what caused the, the injury, you know, that makes it a whole lot easier to do something. Compression. Compression works very, very well for something like uh, chondromalacia when you have a, a the underneath of your kneecap, let's say this is your kneecap and you have a bone under here, typically that fits in nice and snug. But sometimes it's pull off to the edge and now all of a sudden you start wearing a little trough on the inside of your kneecap. And that's because your muscle imbalance between the muscles in the front of your leg and the muscles in the back of your leg. And all of a sudden, this thing that used to be a nice smooth fitting gets pulled off to one side and now you're kind of grinding down the middle. So the compression, you push everything right back down on top, and that's that makes everything, it, it doesn't loosen up. And you can go out and run, you can do everything you, you normally do. But it takes months of getting balance back into the front and back of the muscles. Now, ironically, one of the easiest uh, exercises to do is just a deep knee bend. And you can do that with a, with a compression bandage on or not. But those are things that balance out the front and the back uh, muscles. Uh, sometimes elevating your leg or your foot or whatever helps a little bit of that drainage away. Physical therapy, some lifestyle changes. You know, what are you doing that might have caused that? Maybe you started taking up running. Well, maybe you got into it too fast. Or replacing worn out shoes. Or replacing the arch in supports on the inside. Uh, do some muscle balancing, some stretching. Lots and lots and lots of things that can cause a problem with your hip, your leg, or your foot. But analyze what's going on, what might have caused it, take some remedial action in that area, and then, okay, did it work? Well, at some point in time, you may actually need to go see a doctor, but sometimes you can kind of help yourself, and that's what we're here today to talk about. Muscle strain, that could be from an overuse, going out there doing a lot of things, you come back in, muscle, oh, my shoulder, my back, my leg, my, uh, or it could be an overextension. You're reaching too far to pick something up. You try to pick it up and you strain something. Uh, it could be a sudden impact. It could be a, a trauma kind of injury. You're, you're thrown against something. You uh, are walking and you're not paying attention and all of a sudden you walk off the edge of a curve or into a hole. Uh, it could be an inadequate warm-up or a cool down from whatever exercise you're doing. Uh, it can just be something as simple as muscle fatigue, weakness. You're just not using them. You're going out. All of a sudden, you're using them. They're not as good as they were 20 years ago, or you're using a poor technique. You end up straining the muscle or the ligament group around that muscle. But there are options. Obviously, look at what you're doing. Is there something that you made a change in your life recently? Did, did you start lifting weights? Did you start doing something you didn't do? That's a good place to start. Are you getting adequate rest? 
Uh, is it something that needs ice or heat or some level of compression or elevation? Those are things that, that work out pretty well, pretty easily. But let's say that I'm reaching into the back of the trunk of my car and I'm picking something up and I come back and I do something to my lower back. That's probably a clue. That act of doing whatever I did kind of tweaked my back and then all of a sudden I can feel something there. Well, maybe one of the first things you ought to consider is what I call reverse stretching. You know, instead of sitting there and you're trying to uh, stretch and stretch and pull that muscle longer, maybe what you need to do is pull in the direct push in the direction of whatever's going on. So in other words, let's say that I want to take my thumb and I want to touch it to my elbow or to my wrist. Well, typically I'm just going to be pushing in that direction all the time. And that is not a reverse stretch. That's just a stretch. But what if I'm want to put my, my stretch in the opposite direction toward the, that direction away from my, where my direction is. So in my back, I'm pushing away but I have somebody pushing with their hands on the back or I'm in a machine where I can adjust the weight and I can now stretch by going back, maybe not even going back as far as I want. So in the case of a stretch, I'm pushing in the opposite direction that I want to stretch. And I'm actually stretching that muscle significantly much more than it would ever normally be. So if you're going out and you're beginning to do a new running program or whatever, you know, and you're trying to stretch your legs, you know, maybe you go ahead and you do your normal stretch, but then look, is there a way that you can do a reverse stretch on those same muscles? Because if you can do that, now you're getting a much fuller range of that stretch, which will help alleviate pain or prevent pain down the road. Physical therapy might be, requir might be required, uh, strengthening exercises, but again, you want to strengthen both sides of the equation. If you're having a lower back problem, you definitely need to strengthen your, your stomach muscles too. Uh, the tangent that's uh, trans, uh, it's, it's the one you attach that goes crazy and just, you know, just vibrates and sends a little electrical shots in it. Trans epidural, neural, I can't think of the name of the tens right now. I apologize for that. Massage, sometimes just a simple massage is all that's needed. But there are other options out there too. Arthritis, something that I've had a lot of. Uh, I haven't had myself per se, but I've helped a lot of people who have had problems. And it's almost, you, know, you, you seem to think, well, if I have rheumatoid arthritis, it's an autoimmune disease, I can't do anything about it. Well, if it's an autoimmune disease, it's probably something that's passing through your stomach. Now, why? Because 80% of your immune system is in your gut. So if something you're eating is causing a problem from an autoimmune perspective, Maybe you need to take a look at the food you're, you're taking and putting through your body. Uh, with arthritis, it's an interesting thing because the, the pains are the same, but the cause may be different. Uh, and as we start looking at genetic issues, age, injury, overuse, over time, we find people over 40, over 50 have a lot more arthritic conditions than not. So if I have osteoarthritis, which might be a wear out mechanism, I have something there and normally it's, it's protected and then over time it gets a little bit more uh, loose and now I start getting involved with collagen that's the body never sees but because of the wear out mechanism or the trauma that might have been an injury there your autoimmune system is going to respond and we've talked about that autoimmune response already where you end up with arachidonic acid and cox you know, cyclooxygenase and a lot of other things that are going to go on and if we can shut those things down, that is really and truly a good way of going. Well, one of the ways of shutting some of that stuff down is with type 2 undenatured chicken collagen. Why? Because when you prepare chicken breastbone a certain way, it almost looks like the mirror image of human collagen. Well, your autoimmune system has never seen human collagen because it's always been protected. You have an injury. All of a sudden, it's seeing collagen. It doesn't know what to do with it. It attacks it. That's where you get your swelling, your pain, your redness, your soreness, a little bit of heat, lots of things. That's your autoimmune response. So it could be an osteo. It could be a rheumatoid. But the undenatured chicken collagen is something you can buy over the net. It's, in, it's inexpensive. And you only need about 100, 120 days worth of supply because as you're taking these pills in, it's passing through your gut. Your gut is seeing this on a daily basis. 
and over about 90 days minimum, the immune system says, okay, I'm seeing this enough. Maybe it's not something I need to worry about. And it stops attacking itself. So from an arthritic perspective, having that type 2 undenatured chicken collagen can be a corrective way of doing things. Or if you want to take it early on and take it for at least three or four months, that might be another way of doing a preventive thing down in the world. Sometimes our diet, it might be a dairy diet, it might be gluten. Our diets are going to cause some kind of autoimmune response. So what problem do you have if it's an autoimmune issue? Look at the food you're eating. That may be part of the solution. Okay, let's look at one of those things that almost nobody ever talks about, your fascia. This is actually between your skin and your muscle. You have a white uh, fibrous element that is called fascia. And sometimes when you're having a lower back pain, maybe the fascia in your right shoulder is causing the lower left pain because it's pulling everything out of whack. But it's pain caused by the interaction of the fascia to the muscles. And sometimes it's a chronic low-level pain, maybe like a back pain. Sometimes it's a neck pain. It can be plantar fasciitis in, your, in the arch of your foot. It can be the iliotibial band syndrome. That is on the outside edge of your knees. It goes all the way up. It connects to your hip, goes on down past the knee. I know that if I start running in cold weather, uh, I can get this little ili I IBS, iliotibial band syndrome. And it just, it creates a lot of problems quickly. And it's very, very difficult to stretch. It's very difficult to warm up, especially if you're outside doing something. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out what that was and how to, to go about treating it. Uh, plantar fasciitis is fairly easy. You just uh, uh, insert in the bottom of your shoe that will lift up that plantar fascia area. It's an arch support. Uh, but if it's some other part it may require that you actually do a fascia stretch. And again, that's something I would say, let's look it up on Google. Let's look it up, watch somebody doing it on YouTube. When you're seeing somebody do it, that makes it a whole lot easier than just reading the words and saying, yeah, what, what do they mean by that? But that is something that is, is controllable and it might be the problem, even though it doesn't manifest itself. I have a problem here, but I can't figure out what it is. Well, let me try, let me try fascia, but sometimes it's caused by trauma. Sometimes it's caused by limited movement. You're just not doing much at all, couch potato. Sometimes it's, it's caused by a lot of repetitive movements. So there's not one single thing that causes a fascia problem. And sometimes it's unrelated to where the actual cause of that pain is manifesting itself. Uh, stretching helps, but it has to be a fascia stretching. Heat helps, relaxation, B12 Massage, those are all things that can, in fact, help with that, that problem. What if I happen to have what's called leg cramps, Charlie horse? Uh, sometimes at night, in fact, 75% of the times it's at night, you're in bed, you're asleep or almost asleep, and then all of a sudden something's happening in your foot, in your ankle, in your calf, in your knee, in your – and I'm going to tell you, 90% of the time, it's probably going to be some kind of nutrient deficiency. And – if you have in your bathroom, you know, something in potassium, magnesium, uh, it doesn't take much. Sometimes just a single pill, sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes less. Boom. You can go right back to sleep and not have a problem. If you're outside working a lot, you're sweating a lot, and you're not taking some extra potassium, calcium, or magnesium, that might be a clue because you're not providing what is sweating out of your body in order to make up for that, that lost sweat. Now you're going to have somebody knocking on your door when you go to, to bed at night saying, hey, I need some, but you don't even know what it is. So the hydration, very, very important. Uh, some of the medications that, that might be uh, applicable, look at the contraindications on the medicine. If it talks about leg issues. Now, I'm also kind of including restless leg syndrome in there because that is a leg cramp. Uh, and that's when your, your legs just kind of have the mind of their own. It's a little bit more than just a simple cramp. And there's a lot of causes of le restless leg syndrome. So it's just not a simple one. But if it's something simple, it may just be an electrolyte that you, your body needs. Uh, magnesium is probably one of the biggest ones. I found potassium and calcium are, are, are easy to, to get and take. 
uh, vitamin B6, along with the B12 we, we had mentioned earlier on, on the last one, you know, the gamma amino uh, benzoic acid, GABA, uh, your 5-HTP, that's one of your uh, like folic acid kind of things, uh, melatonin. There are a lot of issues there that, that can be a problem that if you're not getting enough of it, your body's not making it, you're not eating the right kinds of foods, you're going to be deficient in it. Your body's going to tell you one way, shape, or form. And it might be fogginess, it might be a headache, it might be an ache somewhere else. But balanced nutrition is, is something that is a, it plagues 90% of the U.S. population, probably 90% of the world population. But it's something that, that is critical. So that being said, let me go ahead and we're going to talk about sunburn next time we come out. And so let's come on back down to uh, last part here on Amazon and on my website, redolaughlin.com. I have several books that are available that talks about the subconscious mind, our bodies, how we can uh, stop disease, how we can prevent it, slow it down a little bit on Alzheimer's and a book on there, how to write and publish your book for free. So I look forward to catching you all next week. Take care and have a wonderful day. Bye now. Hello and welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is USA Global TV and Radio in partnership with E360 TV. A huge welcome to all of our new fans and thank you to all of our existing loyal fans. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck and our show today is Talking Heads. I am an expert when it comes to the art of elevated listening, the power of listening. And today we are going to be talking about a subject that I find so important that so many of us are in need of remembering or maybe being educated on. And of course, there's no judgment here on this platform. It's all about caring and sharing, providing education, insights, inspiration, and hope. Today's topic is setting boundaries and asking for permission. We will be taking a look at a role play to further give you insights as to human behavior and how setting boundaries and really asking for permission can make or break a relationship. So I just would like to add also that I have a brand new book that's coming out, The Mastering the Power of Elevated Listening. This is coming out on the 21st, which is the International Day of Listening. In this book, you will get solutions for deeper connections, better relationships, and more authentic conversations. And in addition, on that same day, we have our new children's book that is coming out. It's the fifth in our Lady Ella series. It's Lady Ella Listens in the Baobab National Game Park. This book series is to teach children and their families how to listen at an elevated level. All right, so let's get into it. What is setting boundaries and asking for permission? You might think to yourself, that sounds kind of juvenile or it's not something that I'm interested in doing. Well, what we want to remember is that we want to have as effective a conversation or a dialogue or communication as we can have with someone. So we want to start to really listen at an elevated level where we are not judging other people. We're not interrupting them. We're not asking for solutions and we're not stealing the stage. So many times, especially in the last few years, I've seen all of this occur over and over again, where people feel like they're being helpful, but yet they're really not listening. They're actually doing something that the other person hasn't asked for. So when we think about this, we're going to take a look at a role play that really gives us a better understanding of what we're talking about here. So just to tee up this role play, this is a role play. It is not an actual thing that happened. These two people are volunteers who have decided to create this role play so that we can educate other people. So I want you to take a look at it and a listen watching the behavior and also watching the dynamics between the two people and then we'll have a chat about it. Good morning, miss. Good morning, sir. As the new CEO, I um, want to know what everybody does, right? I think that will help me navigate and to know what next steps I should take to make this company successful. What's your positioning uh, anyway? I'm the head of production for this company, sir. Oh, head of production? Yes, sir. Wonderful, good positioning. 
Um, so can you tell me what you want to do? So, so as the head of production, I have a lot of people I work with, a lot of producers I work with, and then we make sure that every production that goes on TV goes to So for example, every morning, Hello, John. a production John. Hey. Hey. comes with hey. Hey. Um, other oh. producers and presenters. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. So from Monday, we have our general yeah. meeting yeah. at yeah. 6 a.m. Yeah. After general meeting, we have yeah. a general yeah. meeting at 12 30 p.m. Yeah. to the start yeah. yeah. everything. Yeah, we'll be there. We'll be done Friday. We'll get a the the best flight. Now, we moving on, last, we also have another meeting on Friday when the start this one's again, everything John. that went to the week on Friday. Correct. And then yeah, at the end of the day, we should yes. company. Yes. 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 Tell everybody I'll be there. Going the way it's supposed to go. But show on TV, current at flagship show, is. Uh, the big morning show where we have other uh, big personalities. Okay, so now let me ask you, you are the head of security, right? So how do you... Co- no, sir. I'm the head of production. Head of production? Yes. I thought you said you're head of security. No, sir. I'm the head of production. I make sure that all the producers are... All right. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, too. Okay, wow. What did we learn from just observing that? Did you feel how uncomfortable it was? We have one person who is coming in to meet with presumably her new manager or new leader, and the person in that position of authority asks what it is that she does, and she says, I'm the head of production. Then he gets a phone call. He takes the call. He tells her to keep talking, which obviously he couldn't be listening to her and listening to the person on the phone at the same time. Then he gets off the call. And he says, oh, as the head of security, et cetera, et cetera. So he wasn't listening. So how could this role play have been different? And how could the outcome have been different? When he received the phone call, he could have said, I'm really sorry, but I need to take this call. Would you mind if I stepped out of the room for a moment and we can continue? Now, when he did that, if he did that, the other person would know that he wasn't capable of listening to her at that moment. And he was showing her the respect that he had to take the call. What else could he have done? He could have said, this call is coming in. I'm not going to take it. I apologize for the interruption. And then she would have known, okay, this is a great time for me to share also. But by taking the call, And continuing to motion her to speak, he basically was completely not able to listen to what she was saying. So how do you think that that relationship would end up working out? Not very well, because both parties are not in alignment. And the woman who is meeting her new boss for the first time probably feels disrespected and that he's not interested in anything that she has to say. Is it possible he was interested in what she had to say? It is possible, but he wasn't demonstrating the power of elevated listening. He was basically just trying to do two things at one time, which is something that we all think that we can do. But I promise you, it's not possible at an elevated level to do more than one thing at a time if you want to be that person providing that safe space for someone to share. So let's talk about what is setting boundaries. Setting boundaries when it comes to listening is basically letting someone know if you are or not available to be fully present and engage with them when they're speaking. So if I were to say to you, audience, I'd like to share something with you. It'll take about five minutes. How would that be? You can come back and say, that's not going to work for me. I don't have five minutes right now. Or like the majority of people that I've seen do, they say, okay, and they continue on doing with whatever it was they were doing. And they're not listening. We know when we're not being heard, we know when someone's not genuinely interested in what it is that we have to say, and we know how that feels. So if you set boundaries and ask for permission, This is much more conducive to having better relationships, more authentic conversations, and deeper connections with people. So the first thing is you set the stage. Is this a time for you to be fully present and engaged as a listener? If you're in the middle of a project, if you have 10 things going on and someone comes up to you and says, I really want to share something with you right now, that's probably not a great time for you to give them your attention because you're preoccupied with whatever it was you were 
we're doing. So what we learn as elevated listeners is we have to set boundaries. You know what, Sue? I really am here for you. I want to hear what you have to say. Right now, I'm in the middle of this project that I'm on a deadline. I can't give you the attention that you need. However, if you can give me an hour, I promise I can be fully committed to listening to what you have to say. How does that sound? Sue comes back and says, well, I really want to tell you right now. Something happened, and right now, I need to tell you. So I could come back to Sue and say, Okay, Sue, go ahead as I continue working on my project, knowing that I'm not possibly able to listen to Sue, but Sue's throwing a tantrum and wants to be heard. Think about how many times maybe you've done that or someone you've seen or someone you know or someone you're in a relationship. You have to say what you have to say at that moment because you are emotionally charged up. And the other person has already let you know this isn't a good time for me, but yet we cannot control ourselves. So what actually happens when we're thinking again about listening at an elevated level, which is a gift that you give to someone, you cannot do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When you set the boundaries and say, again, Sue, I'm here for you, but right now I cannot give you the attention that you deserve, that you've earned, please let me meet with you in an hour when I can be fully present. Now, Sue might continue to press back because Sue is extremely happy, sad, upset, whatever emotion is, is coming up for Sue. And Sue feels that right now I've got to, to get this off my chest. How many times do we do this? I can't talk to you right now. I've got a call coming up. Wait, it'll just take a moment. But no, I told you I have a call. I'm mentally getting ready for the call. I, I, it'll just take a minute. I have to tell you right now. Then the minute turns into two minutes. Then it's five minutes. Then the person can't get on their call because you just had to keep saying whatever it is you were saying. And let's think about it. Unless it's an absolute emergency, we take a deep breath. We let it go. And we think to ourselves, what I have to say is important to me. To me not necessarily to the other person. But yet we force our way, we force our way through. I've got to tell you this information right now. No, you actually don't. Unless it's an absolute emergency, you don't have to do that. So again, what are we talking about here? We're talking about you having a better relationship with someone, you having a deeper connection with someone, you having more authentic conversations with someone. So let's get comfortable with the fact that by giving someone the opportunity to hear what you have to say, I'm really sorry, I'm not available today. I'm not available over the weekend. You are important to me. I'm already doing something else that I decided to do a long time ago or whatever the case is. I do want to hear what you have to say, but it's not possible for me to listen to you and be fully present. Now, the other person might take that as an insult. What do you mean you're not available for me right now? I've done this for you and I've done that for you. And they bring up that whole laundry list of things, passive aggressive behavior, by the way, that has nothing to do with this particular situation at this point in time. When someone starts throwing things at you about all the things that they've done for you, I want you to, again, take a deep breath and say to yourself, this isn't about me. This is about that person. Why is that person bringing up all the things that they've done for me? Because they're feeling something. They're feeling inadequate. They're feeling negative emotions. They're feeling lower vibrations, whatever it is. We're not to be a judge of it. But that doesn't mean that we have to change what we're doing or change our plans because the person wants to share whatever it is at that moment. So asking for permission, again, even on the phone, somebody calls you on the phone, you see their name on the phone, you know the person. What do we tend to do? Even if we're busy, okay, it's so-and-so, it's Bob. I'll pick up the phone. Hey, Bob, blah, 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 blah. Well, Bob never said 
Hey, do you have 10 minutes right now? I need to share something with you. So now I'm thinking, why did I answer the phone? Just because I saw Bob's name, I want to show Bob the respect to answer. I'm walking into a presentation right now. I saw that you were calling and I wanted to let you know, I'll return the call later. So Bob just goes on and on and on, never asks for permission. So what do you think will happen next? The next time Bob calls, I'm probably not going to answer the phone because I know Bob doesn't know how to ask for permission. So Bob goes on the list of people that I can't trust to take a certain amount of time to tell me something. So that causes a lot of negativity as well. When you listen at an elevated level, you're able to take the emotions out of it. So if I see Bob calling, I'm not going to have emotions about it. I'm going to know that Bob and I are not on the same page. That's not a judgment of Bob. It's just stating the fact that I'm willing to listen at a certain level at a certain time and that I want someone to ask for permission to share what it is that they want to share because I want to be totally present for that person. Setting boundaries, the other part of what we're talking about today. If you are doing anything other than listening to the person, you've told them, yes, Bob, I will give you 15 minutes. I have 15 minutes right now. Bob's thinking that you really care about what Bob has to say, but you pick up your phone. You start scrolling through. Maybe you're in the middle of writing something. You start writing. Maybe you're watching television. You go back to watching television. So you're not fully present. You promised something. You promised you would deliver this block of time, but you're not doing it. And therefore, the other person, Bob, in this scenario, I promise you, is going to know that you're not listening at an elevated level. Now, you might think to yourself, wow, this listening at an elevated level, this is a lot of work. Yes, it is a lot of work. But the good news is we don't have to do it all of the time. Because if we're doing it all the time, we can't be getting anything else done. You can't take care of yourself. You can't take care of your family. You can't do your work. You can't do your volunteering, whatever it is that you're doing, because you said you're going to listen at an elevated level. Listening at an elevated level can be exhausting. I do it all week here on our platform. Think of all the people that we interview. We have 41 different shows in a week. And I have a policy here that we do not interrupt our guests. Why? Because we're all about listening at an elevated level. We're all about giving people a safe space to share what they have to share. So if someone's talking and we just cut them off, they're not going to feel safe here. They're going to be like, wow, I went to that channel and that network and they weren't listening to what I had to say. So by the end of the week, when it comes to Friday, I am exhausted because I've been listening at the highest level in addition to producing. So what I want you to realize is it is definitely a gift that you are given or that someone has given to you. You don't take that for granted. I want you to think right now, who in your life is a good listener. Who could you say that person really listens to me? I can think of a few people and I can also think of people who do not listen. I had a conversation with someone recently and the person asked me six times the exact same question. And it was not a conversation that was hours long. It was probably a 10 minute conversation. And finally, I said to the person, because you have to think about how you're going to respond, Jim, I really appreciate the time that you're taking to speak with me today. Are you aware that you've asked me this question six different times? No, I, I didn't ask that question. Yes, you did. And the reason why I'm bringing it to your attention is I really feel like you're not listening to anything I have to say. How do you feel about that? I, I, I want to listen, but I'm driving and uh, I'm sending a text message to someone at the same time. First driving and texting, we already know. So the person admitted they were not listening to me. So I said to myself, okay, not the first time it's happened with this person. When I have something that I really want to share, I'm not sharing it with this person. Even if this person calls and asks me about something, I know this person is not listening at an elevated level.
So again, there's no judgment. It's just about caring and sharing. When you are practicing these skills, by the way, I might add, they are definitely skills. You will stand out. You will stand out and be acknowledged and recognized. And let's take it one step further. The power of listening and setting boundaries and asking for permission is also part of etiquette and manners. It's also part of showing people respect. When you show people respect, they acknowledge it and they appreciate you because you're not like everyone else. You have shown that you have compassion, that you have emotional intelligence, and that you have integrity and that you value the other person. Now, this setting boundaries and asking for permission, is this just with people that you know well, people whom you do know well? No, absolutely not. It's with anyone and everyone. If a complete stranger comes up to talk to you, and we've had this happen, if you're in public transportation, maybe you're at the gym, maybe you're at the grocery store and someone comes up to speak to you about something, you have no idea what it's about, but you can politely say, I'm sorry, miss, ma'am, sir, this isn't a good time for me to speak with you. I, I can't pay attention to what you're saying right now. And I'm giving you the respect to let you know that. And then you just, you move away. If you decide to engage in the conversation and you're not fully present, you're actually taking something away from that person. You can't show them the respect that they're due just by being a human because you're not available emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, physically, whatever it happens to be. You're giving them a gift. You're doing them a service by saying, I'm sorry, but I'm not available for you right now. What's going to happen? They're going to go find someone else and then find someone else. Finally, someone who is available, who does have the skill set to listen, will listen to them. And that's a true gift. I feel that there is a lot of value. There's a lot of joy and happiness in knowing that you care enough about someone and respect yourself enough to set these boundaries. It's not going to be something where you're winning an award. It's not going to be something where everyone's going to like you. It's going to be a skill set that helps foster healthy relationships. Not everyone has the skills and tools yet to do that. If you ask for permission, when you ask for permission and someone comes back and says, I'm not able to at the moment, do not take it personally. It's not personal. Again, they're giving you a gift. The gift is they're telling you the truth. They're not able to be there for you at this time, at this instance for this specific thing. I want to share just a few things with you. The first is that we offer courses for the power of listening. You can go over to our website, usaglobaltv.com slash education. You can meet our coaches and you can also take your listening quiz here. Let's see how good of a listener you are. How effective are your listening skills? Go ahead and take the quiz right here. You can also scroll down and find out more about our courses. The first course that we teach is Mastering the Power of Elevated Listening. This is our foundational course. And once you take this course and you take the quiz that is associated with it, you, when you get 100% on the quiz, will become a team member here at USA Global TV and Radio. We also have other courses that have been created by Dr. Madeline Chan, as well as Caroline Heward and Dr. Sadia Rajput. You can see them here, Music, Voice, and Listening, The Transition, Male and Female Energies, Nature, Plants, and Shrines, Intuition of the Heart, Chakra Psychology, Setting Boundaries, we're talking about today. There's a follow-up here if you want to take the course. And The Art of Being a Professional Interviewer and Mastering Mindfulness to Heal Your Brain. Thank you so much for being here. I am Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck. I do appreciate you for your time. And I do encourage you to look into your heart, look into your soul and decide, how can I be a better listener? How can I provide more comfort and compassion and empathy for people in my life, whether I'm close to them or I'm not? How can I be a better listener? 
we can help you find out. Thanks for your attention. This program has been brought to you in part by Zane Carson Carruth, etiquette and protocol expert, international award-winning author, television show host, and philanthropist. Thank you to Zane, our official diamond sponsor for USA Global TV and Radio in partnership with E360 TV. Zane is the author of the world's first tooth fairy ever, as well as many other children's books. She's also the television host of Elegance, Polished Demeanor, and Posh Living, seen on USA Global TV and Radio. Hi, my name is Zane Carson Carew, and I'm the author of this book, The World's First Tooth Fairy Ever. Reading is magic. Studies have shown that reading to your children lays the foundation for greater success in life. Reading helps develop language and vocabulary skills. It helps improve memory and it encourages curiosity and inspires creativity. The benefits are immeasurable and as a parent, you'll benefit too. In only 10 or 15 minutes a day, you'll be creating more memories and a bonding experience that will last for years to come. So take time to read to your children. Read them books about things that engage and interest them. Tales of fairies and magic fascinate children, and as everyone knows, the Tooth Fairy is at the top of the list. If your child loves magic, wands, adventure, and what child doesn't, you'll love reading them books from the trademarked series The World's First Tooth Fairy Ever. Follow along as Abella, the world's first tooth fairy, accidentally starts the tooth fairy tradition. Learn the tricks of being a professional tooth fairy in the book Abella Starts a Tooth Fairy School. Your child's imagination will soar as you read the adventures of Abella and her magic wand. These wonderful books are available at worldsfirsttoothfairy.com and at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Walmart. To learn more about Zane, contact her through her website, zanecaruth.com. Z-A-N-E-C-A-R-R-U-T-H dot C-O-M. Order Zane's books and merchandise. Contact her about being a keynote speaker at your next event. This program is also brought to you in part by Ella Holly, artist and singer of the single Things That We Do. If I look into your heart, are you looking back at me? Am I everything you want, baby? If my heart was in your hands, would it be for you and me? Would you want to keep it close, baby? baby, baby. Well, I know that if I'm the right guy, the one I dreamed he'd be Give it all that you can, stumble and fall, love will set me free Baby, 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 don't you know you drive me crazy? I love The one I dreamed he'd be 